Hi, and welcome to the Faith Matters Podcast. This is Aubrey Chavez. In this episode, we speak with Jana Spangler on the intersection of action and contemplation. As Tim and I have brought more contemplative practices into our own lives, we've found many benefits, but we've wanted to make sure that we don't lose any of that drive for compassionate service that our faith has done such a good job teaching. Jana is an integral professional life coach with Symmetry Solutions who specializes in working with individuals who are experiencing shifts in their faith, those affected by a loved one's shifting faith and with mixed faith couples. She's attended the Living School, a wisdom school run by the Center for Action and Contemplation under the direction of Father Richard Rohr, where she studied contemplative Christianity and wisdom traditions and how they can support the transforming work of love in ourselves, our communities, and the world. Jana is also a frequent speaker at conferences, workshops, firesides, retreats, and on podcasts, and is a guest lecturer at BYU on issues of faith and development. We had such a great time speaking with Jana, and we hope you enjoy this conversation. Well, Jana, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Um, the The way this podcast came to be actually was that a few weeks ago when we were recording with uh, Tom McConkie, we were uh, talking a little bit about his um, stages of faith that he likes to talk about and that he that he teaches about, and in particular, the Achiever stage and what happens during the Achiever stage and, and afterwards. I feel like... I'm a person that has had a, a very defined achiever stage in my in my life where you know I wanted to accomplish all the things and fix all the things and do all the things. And then, you know, I don't know when it was, five, seven years ago probably, I felt myself sort of starting to move out of that a little bit, mm-hmm. but maybe entering a space where I didn't know what was going to, where I didn't know what was going to replace it. We talked about that a little bit with Tom and Aubrey and I had been uh, had been talking about it. And it's just, you know, how do you, if, um, if you do find yourself in a situation where you've been for years in this, in this achievement mode, you know, and then, uh, and then you're moving more toward something, uh, you know, some, something more contemplative, maybe like we'll, like we'll talk about, how do you end up, how do you end up balancing those two things? And then this is just a big, at the beginning of this year, we, we subscribe to the daily meditations that from Richard Orr and the uh, Center for Action and Contemplation. Mm-hmm. And like, this is literally within 24 hours of us having, you know, several conversations about this and this email arrived and I'll, I'll read it if that's okay. okay sure. So this is, this is Richard. He says, the most important word in our center's name is not action, nor is it contemplation. It's the word and. We need both compassionate action and contemplative practice for the spiritual journey. Without action, our spirituality becomes lifeless and bears no authentic fruit. Without contemplation, all of our doing becomes ego, even if it looks selfless, and it can cause more harm than good. External behavior must be connected to and supported by spiritual spiritual guidance. It doesn't matter which comes first. Action may lead you to contemplation, and contemplation may lead you to action. But finally, they need and feed each other as components of a healthy dynamic relationship with reality. So Aubrey and I read that and just thought, wow, like it's a sign. Like we need to like dive into this topic more, you know, like how, what is like, how do action and contemplation intersect with each other? And we knew a little bit about you. We knew that you had uh, done the living school, which is, you know, related to the center for action and contemplation and thought we need to get Jana on to talk about this. And um, so we're very excited to have you here and would love maybe if we could start just like you could maybe talk a little bit about your experience at the living school, um, what the center for action and contemplation actually is, who Richard Rohr is and and all of that stuff. And then we'll kind of dive in more from there. Okay. Um, Well, it's one of my favorite things to talk about. So I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to talk a little bit about it. Um, So the Living School, as you said, is run by the Center for Action and Contemplation. Richard Rohr is the director. They have other teachers during my time there. um, James Finley and Cynthia Bourgeau were two of the other faculty. They've since added a few that I'm really kind of having some deep jealousy of the people who are still there, (laughs) that they get to interact with these new new teachers. But um, so uh, Richard Rohr is a Franciscan priest. He's a Catholic priest. And he has um, a deep love of the contemplative traditions in Christianity. And I find that in our LDS community, we don't have a a very deep understanding of the roots of that because it happened during the great apostasy, right? So it's not something we really delve into or talk about. And really in Western Christianity, a lot of these threads have been lost when 
Constantinople and Rome split and excommunicated one another. And um, a lot of the, these traditions stayed more with the Eastern churches. But in the West, we kind of followed uh, more of a line of rational thought, um, Greek philosophers, you know, these kinds of things. So Richard Rohr is very influenced by getting back to these roots of deep contemplation of what that can do in our lives. Um, of getting silent, what can we be taught through silence? Um, what can we be taught about God? What can we be taught about ourselves and our humanity? And how can we see the divine DNA in all of creation and all of us? And I was really drawn to his program really because I saw him being able to critique religion in a way that did not throw it out. He has a deep love for it that he can kind of take a step back and look at it in a way that I think is helpful. Because I think when we, it's so easy to get into our own echo chambers. We see yeah. this in politics, we see this in religion, and it, we don't become our best selves if we're not willing to look at ourselves and critique ourselves. So I was really drawn to that in him. And once I got there, I, I didn't really know what I was signing up for. I didn't know what a mystic was. I have never heard this. You know, it sounded pretty woo-woo to me. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't know what I'm getting myself into. But really what I gained from them is um, a new way of, of approaching my spirituality, a new way of approaching my religion that uh, just feels really authentic, really real, really deep. And I also gained a really deep appreciation for my Mormon roots. Really? Because, yes, because one of the things that I noticed is um, as, as from a teacher who is teaching about just the lineage of religion, the lineage of wisdom tradition, the lineage of humankind and in our interaction with the divine, um, I kept seeing things that told me that Joseph Smith had connection to this lineage and mysticism Wow! in a way that I had, I had never imagined. So I learned so much about my faith. From people who were not of my faith. Yeah. And I found that to be really, really interesting. That's amazing. So, yeah. Is there, I, I have so many questions, but yeah. I would love to dive into that comment you just made a little bit more. Yeah. Is, if that's okay. Could you talk about some of those insights that you had about, sure. about our tradition and Joseph Smith in particular? Absolutely. So there were certain, certain things that um, Richard Rohr would explain were kind of lost throughout, you know, uh, the Catholic and Protestant movements. Um, and some of the the things that he is a Franciscan. I, I learned a lot about Catholicism there. But I yeah. I, what what does that mean? Yeah. So, and I'm not an expert. <laughs> I'm not an expert. I've, I've touched it just slightly, but there seem to be different orders. You know, the Jesuits. You'll hear the the Franciscans, yeah. um, and really, they they each kind of have different philosophies. They they have different things that they focus on. I would say. Okay. And so the Franciscan way of seeing things lines up pretty well with some of some of what I see in Joseph Smith. So uh, one of those things is just the the direct connection with the divine that didn't exist um, as strongly in the Protestant teachings of when Joseph Smith arose on right. the scene. Right. So he um, at the time. The way I understand it, Protestant thought was more that Christ was all divine, all, you know, all God, we are all human, we are all debased, mm -hmm. we are, you know, we are we are worthless, but Christ can save us, kind of an idea. And what I saw in, in some of the teachings of, of Richard Rohr and the Franciscans was this idea of, of Christ being all human, all divine, and so are we. Wow. And we we can we can really commune and connect and that we can we can see such a beautiful example of who God is through the person of Jesus um, because of that. Because and, and it can help us learn to embrace our humanity rather than running away from it. So oh, fascinating. So yeah, it's that yeah. sort of non-duality instead of mm -hmm. yes and no, it's yes and yes. Yes. And it and it's our, it speaks to our very nature. Um, this idea of uh, the eternal progression. Um, one of the the pieces of mystical theology they offered at the school was um, that God did not create a tree 
God loved into existence what had always been the eternal nature of trees. You know, and when he says things like that, I'm just hearing intelligences. I'm hearing, you know, yeah. our co-eternality with, with God. And, wow. Um, yeah, some really beautiful, wow. really basic things that, you know, they're just a couple. Yeah, I could go on and on. But those were a few that I really started to appreciate. Like, wow, what what insight, what a gift that Joseph Smith brought to the restoration. Yeah. Love that. Mm-hmm. So will you jump into contemplation and just maybe talk about what that is? I feel like in maybe our, our word for that, or maybe the closest thing we have in our faith tradition is pondering. Mm-hmm. Like we talk a lot about pondering, <laughs> but that's, I mean, to me as a, as a kid, that just meant I was supposed to sit still while I was reading or maybe write or not jump up off my knees after I prayed. And, mm-hmm. and <clears throat> so I, I found a lot of value in, in things like Thomas is taught with real mindfulness and meditation. Yeah. So will you just talk about what you, what you learned there and, and what is contemplation and how is it like is it pondering or yeah. is there something is there um a more do you do you do something um you know every day that is that is more than just thinking is it is it more directed mm-hmm. yeah it's a great question and i think that i think pondering touches on this um and i and i think there have been pieces of this we haven't really focused on ourselves even in our own tradition i remember when i taught young women's um these they're long gone manuals at this point that I was teaching out of, but I remember specifically there was a lesson on prayer and meditation. And I don't really remember that being seeing that in other places in our curriculum, yeah. but I saw that in the young women's manual. And I I always really loved that. Contemplation, meditation, pondering, they all kind of touch on on maybe a similar thing. Would you throw mindfulness in there as well? Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think they're all they're all mechanisms of of pointing to the same thing. But mm-hmm. but to me and and really what what they teach at the school is that contemplation is this is is really tapping into a silence and it's it's more than just being quiet it's it's emptying it's Mm -hmm. emptying of our ego it's emptying of our personality of the of our identifications of the things that that we think we need to make us important Mm. So that we can actually get still with what is the very essence of our true, deep soul, our spirit, our self, our true self. These are some of the words that that they use, you know, true mm-hmm. self to explain what that is that yeah. we're tapping into. But it's something that is just deeply connected to God. Mm. You know, it's that piece of us that has never been wounded. It's that piece of us that is eternal. Is that piece of us that that doesn't have these ego needs that that drive us yeah. throughout our lives, and that there's something really so rich that we can learn about ourselves and others if we can tap into that. Yeah, yeah. you know. Now, when you yeah. say the word ego, is that a specialized word as well in this tradition? Yeah, I mean, and everything has its definition, right? Because some people, psychologists, are going to think of it one way, and different people are going to think of it in a different way. The way they talk about it at the Living School is. Um, that ego is, um, you know, as I explained, it's kind of that piece of us that, that has gone through this life and has learned what it needs to have an identity that really wants to be looked at in, in a good way. You know, when people run up against your ego and see you in a way you don't want to be seen and you have that reaction that's coming from an ego place. Mm -hmm. And, um, and Richard talks about it being, you know, having certain wants. He wants to be separate and superior. Um, and he he talks about this as one of the dangers of religion without this deep contemplation and spirituality is that it can actually serve our ego needs. Yeah. Right. I've yeah. heard him say, who knew religion could be the perfect place to hide from God? Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Um, we we did we talked with Adam Miller about that and we he talked about how we use the law sometimes to build our ego. We can live the law perfectly and then we feel really good about that. Absolutely. And in that way we're kind of living in sin, ironically. Mm-hmm. So I love I keep thinking about this phrase that you said about emptying yourself. And I love that because for me in a way, prayer was a way to fill myself up with ego. I I mean in a you know it was usually in an anxious way, but it was it was like begging God for these things that I really wanted for myself. And so I love this idea that that it's still it is a prayer. It feels like a prayer because it's so connecting and you're you're totally aligning yourself with God's real will by just emptying all of that from 
from you. So I, right? I just love that. Right. I love that image. Because how can we build something new? How can we let something in if we are yes. certain, if we are convinced, yes. if we are telling God what mm-hmm. we think should happen? Mm-hmm. How is that really open communion and, and, and allowing God yeah. to look through us? Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So and, and so, you know, to your point of, of pondering, one of the things that I notice um, a lot now <laughs> that I've studied with them and then being with, um, you know, in my LDS ward and what I notice is that we are very much in our head. Mm-hmm. I don't think this is just us. I think this is Western Christianity. Um, but we are very, and it's American, we are very much in our head. And so we go to pondering. And it, and I think you, you said this, it's, you know, thinking, we're just thinking about things. And how, how they would say contemplation is different than that, mm-hmm. is that rather than staying in your head, and you can be in those ego needs, just as you can be with prayer, mm-hmm. right? And it, it's, it's dropping down into our heart it's mm-hmm. dropping down into this emptying and actually getting out of that mindset altogether yeah. yes well you know all of these things are not the enemy ego is not the enemy the thinking mind is not the enemy mm-hmm. um it's just that you don't want it to be completely running the show yeah. yes right there's something that is trustworthy in our deep souls that we can talk ourselves out of oh, or that. that we can we can we can follow a path that that um, maybe is not where God would have us go. Yeah. There's something trust in, in our default. I love that. I love that. And we cover it up. Like we just bury that. Absolutely. With ego. And, 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 and this is a, this is a big, uh, a big thing that I've noticed just culturally, I think. Mm-hmm. And, and it's informed by our Protestant roots. And I, I love that, you know, um, Tara and Fiona are talking a lot about, you know, these kinds of things and their Christ who heals and, Mm-hmm. and other places but and it comes back to some of this theology of the protestant theology of we are debased yeah you know, but we it, we start with the fall we are we're a fallen people and therefore if we if we have that idea of humanity if we are not of god then we can't be trusted our yeah. own souls cannot be trusted we need outer authority to tell us exactly what to think, how to do things, because we are not trustworthy. And yes. one of the things I find, I work with people who are going through trouble with their faith, who are having deep questions. And one of the things I notice is this desire to want to trust themselves because they're not quite sure what's going on with this external religious thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but they don't, they don't know how to do that. And I feel like um, what I what I hear from the Franciscans in the Living School is, well, let's start from Genesis one. Let's not start at Genesis three with the fall. Mm-hmm. Let's start with the creation wow. of God creating humanity, and it is good. Yeah, it was good. It was very good. Yeah. Um, and when you have that idea of our deep goodness, our deep connection to God, our, our the divine DNA being within us, our divine nature, right? It, it allows us to be able to trust that. Yep. It, it it allows us to be able to go deeply and trust our own souls. And it, and it answers the question that I should trust myself. Because I think that's half the battle is like, do am I allowed to, to trust this feeling that I have or this discomfort that I have? Or should I trust someone else? And I think that people are so uncomfortable with that dissonance because they just don't know what the right thing to do is. Absolutely. They don't know if they're allowed to just believe that they, they can feel that. That's right. Now, when you so when you work with people that are going through questions, do you actually walk them through uh, uh, or teach them about a, a contemplative practice? And are like, is one of your actual steps to do that self emptying mm-hmm. and say like, what do you what do you find when you get beneath not just beneath the body but beneath the mind? Mm-hmm. And when people do that, do they? do they emerge with a sense of personal authority? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it, it's a great question. And I would say that in my practice, I, I work with people and what draws them, right? Mm-hmm. So I don't necessarily always name it as that. For some who are hungry for it, I absolutely name it. And I'll give them resources um, and, and help them through that. Um, but really, most of my clients, they, what they need the most is to be seen, to be honored, and to show that they can be trusted, right? If they can see, if they can experience that with someone that that they're what they're what is coming up from their deepest souls is is 
is okay, mm -hmm. even if it goes against the mainstream. Yeah. That if they can see that it can be honored, they can move slowly, little by little by little, learn to trust themselves. And who who does that honoring? Is that is that you? As, or yeah, is that absolutely. them or is it? You know, I, because, it's a combination. Yeah, yeah. I think it starts it starts with a client relationship yeah. and having someone who's safe to talk to. Because one thing I, I'm just keenly aware of is that we do not have many safe spaces for people to um, have deep questions. It is not culturally acceptable. And I think it's becoming more culturally acceptable. We, we kind of give the lip service to, sure, questions are great. There's always a caveat, but mm -hmm. don't go to these certain core questions. Mm -hmm. You know, you can question polygamy, don't question the resurrection. You can question, you know, our, some of our history. You can question certain things there, but don't question biblical Mormon. You know, we have certain sacred cows that are still sacred cows, mm -hmm. but so many people, they don't choose it, but life has brought them something that they can't quite, they can't quite reconcile and they are just kept in pain when we can't voice that, when we can't give them a place to do an honest wrestle with the deepest and scariest of questions. And and in shame, I feel like that, I feel like the, the, the dangerous part of that is when you try to ignore those feelings you feel, there's there's just such a deep shame because you know that they're there and, and you you can't express it or you're afraid to articulate it. And so that what that feels like in my experience is just shame. And, and so I love this idea of just slowly trying to build this confidence in your own real connection to God, that there's nothing deeply wrong about you. And that when you get to that bottom, when you're fully empty, what you'll see is this real connection to the divine that was, that has always been there. Absolutely. And when, when I, what I notice is when we shut that down, when yes. we shut that down, that shame grows. There's a lot of, of, um, we blame ourselves, the people around us who don't understand what we're going through, blame us, mm -hmm. we take it. Um, and then it comes out. If you don't attend to that, that shame, the anger, the sometimes feelings of betrayal or other things that come up during this time, um, you know, our, our Christian values want to tell us to just, just forgive, get over it. Anger is bad. But if we don't pay attention to that, it doesn't go away. Yeah. It just transmutes into shame, into depression, into yeah. passive aggressive behavior. Mm -hmm. And if if there's no outlet for that, if we don't give people a healthy outlet for that, it's it's going to come out in anger toward all of it. Mm -hmm. And wow. and we we tend to be um, a faith that has seems to have this chain of if this is true, this is true, this is true, this is true. Right. So if you if you mm -hmm. remove one thing, it all collapses. Yeah. And um, and so I see this happen a lot where if we're not giving people permission to do this deep inner work with their own soul, they're going to throw everything out, baby with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. And then we're so confused why they're so angry. Yeah. Wow. And why it's so hard yeah. you know, for everybody around them. Yeah. yeah. I am curious. So one of my. Uh, baby with the backwater issues mm -hmm. is is sort of that action and contemplation thing too, right? And it's obviously very related yeah. to what we've been talking about. But as in my life, as I felt myself, you know, m moving, and I didn't have vocabulary for it, I think as it was happening, but moving a little bit out of that achievement mode, mm -hmm. you know, possibly becoming a little bit more contemplative, although I also didn't have that word, I felt like, like to some extent I was questioning if, if what I was doing was the right thing. It was like, mm -hmm. well, like, you know, I'm 26 or whatever it was, and it, like, I don't, I, my ambition's gone. Like, this is too early. Like, you know what I mean? Like, and I'm curious. So, I, I guess, and I would love to just dive into this really. Like, how, how does one, as they, you know, start successfully getting to that, that um, place where they're, they are self emptying, and they're, I'm not sure, I, I wish I had vocabulary for this too. Like, is there a word for what you find, you know, down when you've moved beyond body and, and mind? Is it being? I think. Eckhart Tolle may use the word being. Uses the word being. Okay. The, the, these people use the true self. Yeah, the true self. Consciousness. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. consciousness, okay. the spirit. I mean, there's so, yeah. each tradition has their ways to yeah. yeah. it, but most wisdom traditions speak to it. Yeah, 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 for sure. So when you, I mean, when you start to get into that mode a little bit more successfully, how does, mm -hmm. um, you know, how do you 
keep that sort of what's the word that we used oh, the the compassionate action as a part of your as a part of your life mm -hmm. you know obviously i i think uh, i i may have felt some temptation at that point to just be like you know i'm i'm good like i just i would you know it, it gets into the nature is my church kind of thing and you know there's not a, maybe there's not a whole lot more to it than that mm -hmm. but i think you know uh, i think what richard Gore is saying is that there is more to it than that absolutely like there's 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 there is uh, achievement and action that should be involved in a in a life that's complete and whole. Absolutely. Um, so this gets back to your original statement that you know your email from him that it, it's the it's the both and mm -hmm. you need yeah. both, and that if you get too far one way or the other, there are going to be pitfalls. So mm -hmm. um, I feel like right now culturally we're a bit strong on the structure, on the action, on the do, 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 do. Mm -hmm. And that's largely representative of this achiever. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where many people reside in, in this society and in, in our church, certainly. And so we were so heavy on that, that I find so many people when they start questioning this structure and how that's working for them, they are so drawn to the other side yeah. because it's been largely, it's not completely, but there's been large, largely absent. And it's like, no, I want to pay attention to my soul. Yeah. Right. You know, they start asking questions. Why do these temple recommend questions? Not ask anything about my soul. Mm -hmm. I can check off a list and be a pretty terrible person and get a temple recommend if I'm really <laughs> honest about yeah. it. Right. Um, if I'm just doing certain things. And affirming certain beliefs, right? Rather than this deep transformation work. And I find so many people coming out of it going, now tell me about these Eastern traditions. Tell me about Buddhism. Tell me about meditation. Yeah, I just want to get into nature and I want to feel that, you know. Yeah. And sometimes those pendulums do need to swing. You know, we need to kind of maybe pay a little more attention here to until that's part of us. Yeah, maybe you are you are truly are underdeveloped on that side. Absolutely. Yeah. I think many of us are in the West. Um then the question becomes, if you stay there, what happens? And it can start to feel like, I mean, we can become nasal gazers, na navel gazers, <laughs> I can't say it. Yeah. <laughs> navel gazers, you know, someone who, yes. Richard says, this, we're not trying to, to teach you people how to do this so that you can sit on a mountain top mm -hmm. and feel good about yourself. Like, yeah. really, the engagement, what we're asked to do, if we're truly Christian, what we're asked to do is this compassionate service with the world. And service, if you're just doing that without contemplation, that can also be ego-driven. Mm -hmm. I can be doing this and patting people on the head. Oh, you poor thing. Yeah. You know, doing it from, from a place of possibly looking down on. I don't think this is always conscious. I think most, by and large, we are good people trying to yeah. do really good things and we have really good hearts. And we do have compassion moving us to service. The difference I see with adding contemplation and having it be compassionate service mm -hmm. has more to do with this word of solidarity rather than service. So oh. do you go into a place where someone is suffering, do what you can and then leave and not be affected or let it really, uh, really move you? Do wow. you, do you really find out what that person's entire circumstance is about do you go feed the hungry and then go home mm -hmm. to your comfortable thing? Or are you having solidarity with people where you're really, really spending time? Do they know your name? Yeah. Wow. You know, and, and that's what, another non-dualistic thing, right? It's you, yeah. it's you and me versus us. Us. Yep. Yes. It's seeing really honoring, honoring the deep dignity of the humanity of other people. Right. So, yeah. so that's the piece that it adds. It's, mm -hmm. it's emptying yourself of all of your judgment. I mean, King Benjamin speaks to this, right? N not having the judgment of how someone got there. Mm -hmm. That's the difference to me between service and solidarity. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And contemplation is a big piece of that. And what I, what I experience, I'm in compassionate service in my word right oh, now. Oh, that's great. Right? Yeah. So <laughs> I, I think about this a lot. <laughs> it's, and you know, there's, we have this thing culturally where it's like, I love to serve because I have some ego needs. I feel really good about myself. I'm doing good things. And we don't want to be the one served. Yeah. I, it's fairly universal. And we have this sure. problem. And we always have to talk in, each other into 
accept the service. Mm-hmm. If no one's accepting the service, then we, yeah. we're, you know, there's no one to serve. We can't do any of this, right? Yeah. But how do we get into a place of more reciprocal solidarity within our words rather than just, oh, you're down on your luck. Now we're going to make sure you know all about how yeah. down you yeah. are on your luck by, by, you know, yeah, trying to yeah. serve you. And I love brings, that word. That's yeah. a great way to just that captures the whole thing. <clears throat> this brings up the issue of vulnerability mm-hmm. as well, obviously, right? Absolutely. So, like, what, uh, we can't. I mean, we can't. We can't say that we're not down on our luck. All of us are down on our luck in some way, mm-hmm. right? But if you were to ask members of my ward right now how I'm down on my luck, mm-hmm. that, they probably wouldn't know, and that's not their fault. It's because I'm. I like I've got my shell, mm-hmm. you know. I don't, and I don't want any anyone to know what my issues are. Right. And so, like, as I, I guess, I don't know how that uh, how that comes into contemplation, mm-hmm. action, and like acceptance mm-hmm. of, of action. But I'm curious if you have your thoughts about that. Well, I just I have a I have a kind of a personal personal experience with that. You know, several years ago, there, my my daughter experienced an injury, and and uh, this was about a year into me having some really deep questions and spending a year not wanting anyone to know that I was having questions because I just had this intuition and mm-hmm. maybe some of it justified, maybe some of it imagined that I was going to be not trusted. I was going to never be able to hold another calling of, of any um, import or whatever, you know, um, if anyone knew what was mm-hmm. going on inside me. But as, as the board gathered around us in such beautiful ways, when my, you know, the whole board had a fast for her and, and I just remember being really struck with this idea that we are so good with these outer things. You know, if someone passes away, if someone, um, you know, has an injury, illness, we seem to be we seem to be okay being vulnerable in those positions, those those instances. But I started to wonder about all the other people who are having questions of their faith. What about? people who are having trouble in their marriage? What about people who have mental illness that they're in depression or other things that they're dealing with that are those things we don't want people to see? Or just other struggles, struggles with self-esteem, struggles with, we we don't tend to be very vulnerable with that. And it shuts down our ability to actually connect in these deeper ways Mm -hmm. in more solidarity when we're not willing to be vulnerable. Yeah. It strikes me that if we were trying, I, I'm thinking of Richard Rohr's first half of life and second half of life, like, and, and, and this, he has this, um, in Falling Upwards, he talks about that the first half of life, you're building this container and you, you kind of, you need a little bit of ego to just develop yourself, to have something so that in the second half of life, you can hold your gifts that you're going to deliver for the rest of your life yes. to the world. And, and I keep thinking that, you know, if we were, if we had a church whose goal was to just help us have this second half of life experience, I it probably would look a lot like what we do because you have to build that container. And and I think, you know, you can be on compassionate service in two ways. Mm-hmm. You can do it so it's building your ego, but but probably it looks exactly like someone who's really living in that second half of life and doing it out of love. And so as much as I feel like squished sometimes by all of these to-dos, mm-hmm. I, I think... Hopefully, if I can get in the right mind space, yeah. my life would look the same. It just, you know, it's it's a it's a real change on the inside. Absolutely, that I'm struggling with. You know, absolutely. I mean, I, if I'm if I'm doing the dishes, something I don't love to do, and I do all the time. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Not as much as probably my husband would like. He does a lot of the dishes. <laughs> um, but you know, when I, I can do the dishes, and I can be just grumpy about the to do list and about one more thing that. I have to do before I can have some imagined rest, you know, yeah. whatever that is. If I bring attention to it and intention to it, and if I just get present in the moment mm-hmm. and I notice just what it feels like to have water pouring over my skin or what I am doing in an act of service of, you know, just in service of order in the home that, you know, brings something to all of our spirits that is, is hard to name, you yeah. know, but if I, if I get really intentional with those things, it's yeah. that contemplative aspect that you can bring in in any place. It doesn't just have to be sitting alone on your mat or, or after prayer or, 
yeah. it can it can be part of your daily life. This is what mind, mindfulness is trying to bring. Right, in, right. You're walking with yeah. it. It's it's in your walk. And yeah. as as I as I start thinking about those things, it, it starts to for the first time really make sense what we hear about praying always in the scriptures. Yeah. yeah. I always used to think, how is that even possible? Yeah. Because I always imagined prayer was just it was words. Active it was words, words in your mind. It, yeah. And it was filling filling the space mm-hmm. with wordiness um, and busyness. It's But, you know, you can bring this active of mm-hmm. mindfulness to your daily life. I love that. It yeah. seems that action in the now is, it is that sort of... Uh, solidarity oriented action mm-hmm. and action in the in the past you know out of guilt or anxiety is not or action in the future out of like the pats on the back that i think i'm going to get out of it are uh, are you know eliminating that that sense of solidarity and so i've always thought of i guess i've always thought of contemplation as the place where you live in the now mm-hmm. but like bringing that now into your action that's that seems like how it's how you can actually connect with with other people as you uh, yeah. as you interact with them. I've, I've never thought about that so yeah. much. Yeah, it's super powerful. Yeah. There are definitely ways to do this both and even in a simultaneous moment. And what happens is that our action comes from a totally different place. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned Tom McConkey. He uses a phrase, and I'm probably going to butcher it, <laughs> that it's it's hating ourselves into, into action, hating ourselves into moving movement, um, which can happen at this achiever stage, right? Um Rather than, you know, Richard Richard would say when people would start asking questions in the first year of the program, it's a two-year program. Mm-hmm. And the first year is all about contemplation, just really mm-hmm. it's about emptying, it's learning what that is. And they would ask about a rhythm of life project, the projects that we did um, in the second year of the school. Uh, and people would ask about it. He says, don't even think about it right now. Because if you think about it right now, it's coming from ego, it's coming from your head, it's coming from your thinking mind. We want, that's not where we want that particular action to come from. We want it to come from this just outpouring of wow. God moving through us into, you know, this compassionate action wow. of really seeing other people, being in solidarity with other people. That's where we want our action to come from. Yeah. Um, wow. to, to really tap into this being Christian and this Christian yeah. transformation. So, um, so yeah, Love it. that's, that's, so, that's how it affects our action. Yeah. What do you do? Cause I so identify with that feeling of just like, Ooh, like I gotta, think, I gotta do this thing and it's like looming and, mm-hmm. and I feel like all of this tightness. And so what do you do in that moment? Like when you're feeling like compelled out of just guilt mm-hmm. or anxiety or all of those things that shouldn't be the, mm-hmm. shouldn't be the impetus. What do you do in that yeah. moment? Well, the temptation, right, is then to hate our anxiety, right? And to, yes. well, that's not good. We got to stop. That. Yeah. Yeah. So really what contemplation invites us to do is just pay attention to it. Okay. So to the anxiety, you're saying. pay attention to the anxiety, pay attention to what is, pay attention to all of those motivations that are going on inside us. Mm-hmm. Um, You know, the goal here is not to get rid of the ego. The goal is to notice how it is, it is informing us so that we're not acting unconsciously Mm. and being driven by it or being driven by the shame, being driven by the to do's. And so in that moment, it's, it's, it's a mindfulness practice. Yeah. And uh, just to to be really pragmatic with this question, like when you, is it, is it analyzing that anxiety in any way or is it simply noticing? So mindfulness um, to me means that we're paying attention to it and we're doing it without judgment. Mm -hmm. So it is a noticing. A a phrase I use um, with my clients a lot is to say, isn't that interesting? Hmm. You're just kind of witnessing because there's this piece of our true self that's always there in awareness that can notice things. This is kind of what the mindfulness traditions teach us, right? If you were your body, you wouldn't be able to notice what's going on in your body. If you were your emotions, you wouldn't be able to notice what they are. If you are your thoughts, you wouldn't be able to notice what your thoughts are. So there's a a witness that you can tap into in your true self that can witness all of these things and just say, isn't that interesting? I'm feeling some anxiety. Now I can get curious about that. Mm -hmm. Now I can get curious about that anxiety, but yeah. a lot of the time, just paying attention to something like that, you know, really intentionally, 
can start to um, dissolve the that the angst because yeah. so often it's our not wanting it's the resistance. to be it's the resistance yeah. to that is giving us that unnecessary piece of suffering. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, I feel that. Yeah. If um if someone were to be sort of at that point where they're they've you know they've lived a, a life full of action you know up to this point mm -hmm. and they're now saying I'm interested in, in that contemplative practice and that contemplative tradition yes. but I don't want to get rid of my uh, uh, rid of my ambition uh, we, you know right. my compassionate ambition right you might say like what would you what are the next steps how does someone actually adopt a contemplative practice without and and hopefully in the process avoid throwing out that the baby with the bathwater right so you know it's one thing if you are um if you are rejecting something in your life that mm -hmm. if, if you are really turned off by your action then you're going to have more of that pendulum swing if the action is still working well for you i don't think you have to even think about wanting to leave it behind mm -hmm. you know it's kind of natural and development oh, interesting. to yeah. just pay attention to what is happening to you and the, the good parts of that come with you mm -hmm. it just tends to be with development what we see is it just tends to be tempered by maybe new awarenesses yeah. so we're not going to just leave behind all action i'm not just going to be at risk any moment of just being a bump on a log <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and never doing anything for anyone else again because i'm just so yeah. enjoying the feeling i mean we, yeah. there's almost like a fear though in the achiever that says oh that that's that's too much yeah um i i don't see that happening a whole lot you know when you've done the achieving if you've done the achiever stage well that's typically what pulls us into yeah. that that next phase of development anyway yeah. you know i just like i love in our society what we whenever we talk about development it's like okay i've got the ladder now and yep. i'm going to climb it <laughs> yes and you are going to tell me what is in the yeah. next stage and i'm going mm -hmm. to act my way into that yes yeah and and that's just not the way development typically works. yes right. and that analogy doesn't actually work because to go on to the next run run you have to leave the the run behind right, right. that's what yeah. we're, that's and, what we're and saying it, it feels it not very counterintuitive right and, and it feels kind of scary and really shifts in development it can feel kind of scary because we we tend to have to let go of some things as, as we said before yeah. we can kind of adopt something new and that that space in between is super uncomfortable. Yeah. We don't but, like, and people, yeah. we don't like discomfort. Yeah. We tend to think we've done something wrong if we're in discomfort. But it, it's so ingrained in, I, I think we all know this, you don't get stronger muscles without pain. Yeah. Like we don't grow without discomfort. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I, I don't know. I, I think the life of Jesus is such an example of this. Like Christ came here he did not keep himself above the suffering. He descended down below all. Yeah. He says, I am the way. And yet we as his followers have been trying to climb back up ever since. We've been trying to get out of that. If I feel any of this, I'm doing something wrong. And, you know, I need to feel good and peaceful. And that's how I know I'm on the right track. Yeah. Rather than understanding how deeply ingrained pain mm -hmm. and discomfort is in our own growth. Yeah. So if we're going to be a people who are all about eternal progression and growth, we've got to learn to yes. tolerate that in a way that actually helps us transform. And this is Terrell and Fiona a little bit. Mm -hmm. When they when they say that we've mistranslated, oh, we've often mistranslated Christ as Savior, and the more yes. appropriate translation often would be healer. Mm -hmm. Like healing implies brokenness. And so like our only way to actually connect with with Christ mm -hmm. uh, as as healer is to be broken, Absolutely. is to be in pain. You know, and so without absent that, we're not we're not able to make that that true divine connection. Absolutely, the resurrected Christ kept his wounds. Mm. Mm. He kept his wounds. These are not things to be to be ashamed of. They are not things to run away from. They are deeply part of us. Love that. Yeah. I've heard you say before that um, Richard Moore talked about how the opposite. We we always say the opposite of faith is certainty, but he he added the opposite of faith is control. Mm -hmm. And the, which really spoke to me. I think that's why it's so uncomfortable because we want to know where the where the next rung is and how long it's going to take and exactly what we need to do to get there. And and it feels like real faith to just be so open and accepting to whatever, however it looks. And yes. we don't and and just accepting that we don't know what that's going to look like and that's uncomfortable and absolutely that's faith. There there is this um, you know you, you see strands of this as we talk about faith um, in in within the LBS culture. 
Um, there are some schools of thought that would tell you because we know so much about the nature of who we are, where we've come from, the nature of God, it, that helps us have better faith. Mm. But there's another school of thought that says letting go of our certainty and having it, us not really know, having us understand that God is so big, God is so not completely knowable that um, that it, it, it's it's a vulnerable thing to admit that. I think faith is a vulnerable act. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is an act of saying, "I don't know," and I feel something that is good and benevolent, and I trust that God is on my side. You know, I like to talk about faith as more of an of a, of a relationship word. You know, something that is more felt from the heart than necessarily affirmed from the head. I know these yeah. things. I'm going to check them off. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it, it can add a dimension to our faith that that adds a depth. You yeah. Know? Um, if I can share one little thing that James, yeah. James Finley um, from the Living School shares about this, he uses the example of of a married couple, someone who's been together, you know, for decades, and one says to the other. You know, um, I just, I love you so much. I love you more today than I did yesterday. And their spouse says, um, I feel the same way. You know, I just, just feel that our love grows all the time. And, and then they say to each other, you know, I wonder if tomorrow I love you even more than today. And, um, and they affirm that. Yeah, I, I think, I think that's true. I think it will. And then they wonder, will there ever be a time when we will hit the ceiling where there will be no more love that can be yeah. had? <laughs> right? So no, I don't think so. You know, we kind of know this about love. There's like it, it is endless, it is infinite. Yeah. And there's something about having a little bit of mystery, a little bit of uncertainty mm-hmm. about who God is, that I have an infinity of growing into that. There's never a ceiling. It does not stifle me. I can, I can, yeah. I can dive into faith and into a growth into that and what that means forever. I love that. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. I think that's the perfect place to wrap it up. All right. Thank yeah. you so much, Dana. Thank this you. Was truly so many incredible. gems. That was incredible. Thank you. It's a great conversation. Thanks. Thanks so much for joining us for this conversation with Jana Spangler. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, remember you can head over to our YouTube channel to watch a video of the conversation or to our website for a full transcript. If you'd like to support Faith Matters, we'd love for you to leave us a rating on your podcast provider or a thumbs up on YouTube. Thanks so much for listening. And as always, you can check out more at faithmatters.org.